Well, I'm John Haller with Fellowship Bible Chapel, and I'm here with Jacob Prash of Moriel Ministries. And Jacob's speaking this weekend at uh, Fellowship Bible Chapel, a couple sessions this morning and uh, two sessions tomorrow morning. And you'll be able to find those uh, on our YouTube channel. But Jacob and I were just both recently in Israel. Jacob, you were there, left about a week before we got there. And so we thought we'd just talk a little bit about some of the things that we saw and observed going on. Uh, it was my third trip to Israel. Jacob, you, you lived there for a long time, didn't you? Absolutely, for many years. Okay, and you lived up mainly in the Galilee region? Galilee and in Jerusalem. Jerusalem. And, uh, you know, there's some things I observed. One of the things that I observed is we spent a lot of time with a, a great guide named Joel, uh, a guide named Joel Kramer, archaeologist and teacher and pastor here in the United States before he went over there about 10 years ago. And Jacob and David Lister know, know Joel and his ministry. So we, it was just Pam and I and Joel, and we spent a few days uh, first in Hebron and at the Herodian, and then up in the central highlands, the central mountains of Israel at Shechem, Shiloh, uh, the Palestinian city of Nablus, which is around Shechem, uh, Samaria, Mount Gerizim, Ai, Bethel, tremendous sites, and Jericho, tremendous sites, but all up in an area where a lot of, a lot of church tour groups just don't go anymore. That's Why is good. that? Well, there's harassment of tourist groups sometimes, but it's essentially the incapacity of the Israeli military police to guarantee the security of foreign tourists 24-7. There's only one major tourist hotel in the entire West Bank. That is in Ariel. And when you take groups into the West Bank, you have to have an armor-plated bus. It's a separate bus with bulletproof glass and so forth. So there are logistical problems going there. Tourists are generally safe. Tourists are generally safe. They won't be targeted. But there can be situations extraneous to anything to do with the tourists in which anyone who happens to be there at the time could be caught up in by virtue of mere circumstances. So that's the concern. Additionally, there are disputes between the Israeli government, between religious Jews, between the archaeological community from the uh, Department of Antiquities at Hebrew University, and of course the Palestinian Authority. The archaeology, particularly the tells, prove that the Jews are the indigenous people. Archaeology doesn't lie. The UN lies. Politicians lie. But archaeology doesn't. And the archaeological record plainly shows that Hebrews are the indigenous people, that they predate any kind of Arab presence whatsoever. The only people there as long as the Jews were the Canaanites, basically affirming the biblical record. This takes on a political intensity. Nowhere more, however, than in East Jerusalem and in the Temple Mount. Nowhere more than in East Jerusalem and the Temple Mount. What's not argued about in the UN with the recent UNESCO decisions uh, and vote against Israel was that the archaeological record supports the claims of Israel to be the indigenous people. It's what I always point out. An Apache cannot, by definition, occupy Arizona. They're the indigenous people. An Irishman cannot occupy County Dipperary. They're the indigenous people. A Maori cannot occupy New Zealand. They're the indigenous people. But somehow a Jew can occupy Jerusalem. A Jew can occupy Jericho. A Jew can occupy Hebron. How can the indigenous people be called an occupying presence? Well, logically and archaeologically and historically, they can't. But politically, they can by the United Nations. Well, in some of the early, some of the sites we went to where uh, under the British mandate and up into the 1930s, archaeolog archaeologists went in there. And one of the things that was true of those archaeologists is that they actually believed the Bible was true. And that's why they dug at sites like Bethel and I. But then, uh, and Jericho, and the historical record of Jericho, and if you look at some of the early charts, even of Kathleen Kenyon, who I, having seen what she wrote in her early writings and charts, and then what she ended up being was very pro-Palestinian after the 1948 war, it's clear, I mean, I think the lady was demonic, uh, the way she, and she was very pro-Palestinian. So she changed her history, she just flat out lied. And you see the archaeology community over there. 
denying the history that's there in the rocks and the tells that proves that the Jewish people are the indigenous yes. people there. And my observation was that what the textual critics did to the text in deconstructing it and making everybody question the text the so-called, and I'll put it in scare quotes, the so-called biblical archaeologists have done the same, exact same thing in the field of archaeology and deconstructed the truth of what's there to prove a lie that this people, this recent people called the Palestinians, have some right to the land. Yes, they've attempted to do so. Well, Kenyon was a politically motivated reconstructionist. As you say, she dishonestly rewrote the history. But I would point out that there have been a number of archaeologists, including Christian ones, such as uh, Dr. John Woodhead, such as Dr. James Fleming, as well as, again, archaeologists from the Department of Antiquities at Hebrew University, Dr. Asher Kaufman, uh, Dr. Dan Bahat. Their findings are much more honest, much more do better documented, and they verify the indigenous nature of, of, of the Jewish people to that land. Also is Qumran. Qumran is indisputable. It shows the Jewish presence in the West Bank and in, in Jerusalem, predating anything that followed it, including the Byzantine Empire, much less the Islamic invasions. We have to understand something. They will argue, that is, those who are sympathetic to the Palestinians, Palestinian Arabs, they will argue you have no right to impose your Judeo-Christian interpretations of Scripture on other people and make it a matter of international law. The United Nations has decided thus. First of all, the United Nations has no right to write international law based on resolutions. International law, as you know, comes treaties. from treaties. It comes from treaties between nations. So it has no basis in international law. Secondly, what is actually happening is, far from it being the Judeo-Christian claims to the land based on the Judeo-Christian scriptures, we have archaeology on our side. It is Islam dividing the world into Dar al-Harb and Dar al-Islam that makes that claim. They believe that once Muslims conquer a land, it's part of the world of Islam, Dar al-Islam. Otherwise, jihad needs to be waged against it, Dar al-Harb. It's an affront to their religious system. What they're essentially demanding, and the basis of their claims, is only based on an insistence that other nations and other faiths acquiesce to their religious presuppositions, that their God, Allah, gave them the land. One, it has no basis in history and no supportable basis in archaeology in terms of the archaeological record. Well, and the interesting thing, too, is that uh, as we were traveling around what's, I think, improperly called the West Bank, Judea and Samaria, yes. um, it, it, it is disconcerting to an American to come up to a sign and a checkpoint, and there's a big red sign there that says, entry by Israeli citizens is forbidden and against the law. Uh, I'll give you one story. We went to Shechem, which is in the, the city called Nablus, and the day before we were there, there had been a shooting of just a, a village just right next to Nablus, and a Jewish settler is shot and killed a Palestinian. So the Jerusalem Post is reporting it that this man, you know, they were hundreds of Palestinians were throwing rocks at cars, entering the Jewish settlement there, uh, Hara or whatever the name of the town was. And this man felt he was being lynched and he got out and shot and killed a Palestinian and wounded a Palestinian journalist. But the Palestinian websites were all saying that a uh, Jewish settler opens fire on uh, Palestinians walking down the street. Well, they weren't walking down the street. They were throwing rocks. So when we went into Nablus, there was a, a checkpoint there with about six to eight soldiers. And because we had an Israeli license plate on the car, our guide's car, they waved us in. So we went to Shechem, we went to Jacob's Well, and then we came back out to go up to Mount Gerizim, and we get to the checkpoint, and there's about two or three dozen Palestinian cars and trucks sitting in a line. So we drove up, and as soldiers, you know, they get their guns up because they get stabbed at these checkpoints. I mean, they've been killed, and this is a checkpoint where Israeli soldiers have been attacked a number of times. 
And we had, had to talk our way through. Because we were Americans, they let us through eventually. But it was interesting, the reaction of the lead soldier. He was, he asked, what were you guys doing in Nablus? First, they didn't want us to get out. And they said, you can't get out of here because Nablus is dangerous. And we said, well, if it's dangerous, then you should let us out of here. Because there's no place, there's no hotel there. Nothing. There's nothing to stay. And while we didn't really fear in danger, you know, our guide did say sometimes they come and they start throw rocks at his car and him because they're unhappy. But, and so the day after we were, like the day after we were in Hebron, there was riots. The day after we were in Nablus, there were riots. So it seemed like it kind of followed us around. But the reaction of this, the lead soldier there was, we told him we went to Shechem, or Joel told him we went to Shechem, and he said, wow, you know, I'm, I'm an Orthodox Jew, I'm very religious, all my life I've wanted to go to Shechem, and I, I can't go there. And it's just one mile walk. tell me about it. Because he got very sort of emotional about it. And that's the interesting thing that a lot of tour, as you know, it's, it's hard to go there with a big tour group because yes. of the insurance and security requirements. But unfortunately, a lot of Christians never get to see the site where the conquest occurred, where the tabernacle stood at Shiloh for 400 years. And you miss, even in the one museum, Friends of Zion Museum in Jerusalem, when they show their sort of map through the land, they go up the coast and around over to the Galilee and then down the Jordan. And they miss the Central Highlands, the mountains. Yes. And that's the historical biblical heartland. I mean, Shechem is absolutely probably the fourth or fifth most mentioned city in the Bible. Jer I think they, it's a close call between Jericho and Shechem. But the history there is so rich. The, the thing that struck me, too, was you drive for 20, 30 miles through the mountains of, of these steep hillsides and mountains, and every hillside is terraced for farming. Absolutely. For mile after, I, it's, it's shocking. I, to me, it was shocking because you read Kathleen Kenyon, and she says, well, there were no Jews here. If they were, they were just a small group of people that lived in the mountains. Well, they were a very busy small group of people if they lived there because it takes... I would, it was shocking to me, Jacob, how, much ro how many rocks have been moved to create those terraced hillsides. That land has been under cultivation for centuries. In fact, pre-Byzantine. Uh, there's no problem verifying that. Again, also, with simply tell excavation, there's no point in verifying any of these things. It's not a problem. The problem is factual evidence is interpreted politically and in terms of the narrative. If you violate the narrative, the facts just don't matter. They speak of Palestine and Palestinian. In the Second World War, there were 30,000 Jewish soldiers from what is today Israel who fought in the British Army as the Palestinian Legion. None of them were Arabs. They were all Jews. The first name of the Jerusalem Post was the Palestine Post. The first name of the uh, Israeli Philharmonic Orchestra was the Palestine Philharmonic Orchestra. The name was expropriated by them to themselves. Don't forget, the people of Judea, Samaria, the West Bank, went to sleep one day in the early 1970s as Jordanians woke up the next day and were told that they were Palestinians. The whole thing is a mythical fabrication. It is a complete nonsense. Now, no one denies there's an, there's an Arab population that has been there for some generations. Nobody denies that. But you cannot deny either that the Jewish populations were driven out in pogroms in the 1920s from both Judea and Samaria, the West Bank, as well as from Gaza. Additionally, there's in fact, never I been... think down at Hebron, that's there correct. was a, a massacre correct. at Hebron and in East the Jerusalem. late 1920s. Correct. Neither, however, has there ever been a Palestinian state. If you want to talk about oppression of the indigenous Arab population, which is not truly indigenous, look what the Turks did. The Turks subjugated the Arabs as a permanent underclass that were extremely maltreated. Well, even if you, would you, and you know, I know you've been there, went up to the Samaritan village... Absolutely. Up on Mount Gerizim, and you look down on Nablus, and we were there, it was Friday morning, and they're broadcasting the hate preachers from the mosque on loudspeaker. Correct. You can hear them up on the mountain, and you, I don't understand Arab, Arabic, but you can tell that this is not, they're not reading something equivalent Correct. to the Psalms up there or down there. 
but in the middle of Nablus is, you can see you have Nablus, uh, normal, fairly normal city. It, it's not the nicest place. But then there's this very highly de densely populated region, part of the city, that's a Palestinian refugee camp. And these, these people have inherited refugee status because they went there, they fled from other areas to that part, to that place in the 1948 War of Independence. And so for 70 years, effectively, now they've been trapped in this refugee camp surrounded by other Arabs. And they're, they're mistreated. It, it's not a nice place. And it's where a lot of the terrorists have come from. You drive down the streets of Nablus, and you'll see a, a martyr sign. Yes. And you will also see pictures of Arab young men on plastered on posters or painted on walls. And this is a picture of them be, you know, taken the night before the morning of their terrorist suicide bombing terrorist attack. And so they're lionized throughout these areas. So it's very tense. And the one thing that struck me too as we traveled all over was the the division in the land. Up on Mount Gerizim, there's a huge mansion. I mean, as big yes. as anything you'd see in the United States. And my, I asked our guide, I, he said, that's probably the richest man in the, what they call the West Bank. And I said, you know, I suppose then that he sold security fencing to the, <laughs> to the Israeli government because it's just mile after mile after mile on the separate roads and that type of thing. And you see the division in the land. And then you get to, let's talk a little bit about Jerusalem. We were there on Jerusalem Day, the 50th anniversary celebration, the reunification of the city. A couple things that initially struck me was that uh, we, we came in on the bus from the airport, and we came through an ortho, I think it was a Haredim, I'm not sure if I'm saying that Haredim. right. Haredim. Uh, neighborhood. And in a kilometer, you know, six-tenths of a mile roughly, I know if I had been counting, I would have counted over 100 baby carriages. There were hundreds of little, I mean hundreds of little kids in a half a mile walking up and down the street running around. And these Orthodox Jewish neighborhoods, I mean, they all have six, seven, eight, nine, ten or more kids. And so that struck me was the number of children that were there. But even in Jerusalem, on my cell phone, well, one day I, I just said, well, I wonder what the directions were to get from where we were in Jerusalem at the apartment we stayed in to Hebron. And so I put it in Google Maps, and it said, that route is not possible. <laughs> and we go to Hebron, and there's all the, we went to the Cave of Machpelah and Mamre and the Tel of Hebron. But then, you know, you come, and you're driving through no man's land, and there's abandoned billy buildings in between, and it's clear that this is sort of an epicenter of the conflict between the sons of Isaac even to this day. And then you come to Jerusalem and you understand that before 1948, before 1967, Jerusalem was divided like that as yes. well. Absolutely. And, well, before 1967, Christians were restricted and Jews were certainly banned altogether from having access to the holy sites. Under the Israelis, all people of all faiths have access to all holy sites. But something else that is not reported in the mainstream press is that the standard of living of Gaza Arabs increased 370% under the Israelis compared to what it had been under Nasser in Egypt. And the standard of living of West Bank Arabs increased 320% well, under I tell the Israelis. You, I'll tell you a story. We went to Ai, where the bat... You yes. Know, the, ambush took place and we know the story of Achan and all that and the you know Joshua led them there and they went in they assaulted the city they burned it uh, right around the tell there at I are mansions that you would see yes. like in Beverly Hills yes. and I mean it's not one or two it's dozens of these things so there's a lot of wealth and prosperity I, I actually told a deputy council general of Israel at a meeting he said, you know, what, what do we need to do? And I said, you need to tell the story. You need to take people up there and show them these mansions, show them the shopping malls, show them the nice buildings in Ramallah and all these things that have been built and that it's that they don't all live in squalor. You know, you have this vision of the what they call the Palestinian people living in squalor and uh, 
tents and that type of thing. And there are poor areas, just like there are other places, but there's areas that are as wealthy and as prosperous as any in the city of Jerusalem, as any throughout Israel. Again, the standard of living escalated dramatically in terms of everything from employment to reduced infant mortality to increased longevity under the Israelis. The reason those things have decreased is once the Israelis forfeited power to the, to mm. the Arab populations. Under Hamas, everything was expropriated for their jihad, and under the Palestinian Authority, everything, or almost much of the international aid and so forth, in addition to what the Israelis left in terms of infrastructure, was pilfered, was essentially pilfered by Arafat's people. That's why people turned to Hamas. But then Hamas continued the pilfering for jihadist purposes. They've done it to themselves. The Israelis <laughs> only did those people good in terms of hospitals, in terms of employment, in terms of increased standard of living. The Israelis only did those people good. Look at the Arab population of Israel proper. You're much better off there than you are in virtually any of the surrounding Arab countries. The only Arab countries that have a high standard <laughs> of living are the ones where you have high oil revenue relative to a low population. But anywhere else, you're better off in Israel if you were an Arab. But this is particularly true of Arab Christians. They're persecuted everywhere, in Iran, in Saudi Arabia, and nobody says anything, including our own government. They're persecuted even in moderate Arab countries like Jordan. Nobody says a word. The only country in the Middle East guaranteeing the religious freedom of Arab Christians is Israel. Yet they're the ones who are singled out by the popular narrative. Well, you can go through the checkpoint down to Bethlehem. And it, it, so let's talk a little. For, we'll get up. We'll get to Bethlehem in a minute. But let's talk about because Trump came to Israel, the first sitting president of the United States to visit the Western Wall at the Temple Mount. And I know that from being there, um, the Arab population in the Palestinian areas was really upset by the symbolism of Trump going and praying at the wall and not going to any of the Arab, uh, the Muslim holy sites as up on the Temple Mount, which they consider theirs, but yes. which it's not. So what, was, what do you think about the Trump visit? First of all, I was troubled by his visit to Saudi Arabia before coming to Israel. I've been to Saudi Arabia, and I know what it's like there for Christians and for others. Not a word was said. We have to drive the terrorists out, he said. Not a word was said about the fact that Saudi Arabia funds the operation and construction of Islamic institutions that are Salafist, that are Wahhabist, that engender support for radical, Islam, radical interpretations of Islam, and, well, resulting and in support for terror. Monday night, we went up to Haifa to see mutual friends uh, in, how do you say the town? Nah, nah, Nahariya. Nahariya. And, on our, and they, they had moved to Israel from Manchester. And so after we and they mentioned to us during dinner that the Islamic infiltration into Manchester, England, and, and the denial by the government and the police Absolutely. that is there. And we talked about that a little bit, and then the terrorist bombing took place uh, at the arena there in Manchester on, uh, while we were driving back to Jerusalem. A, a notice of it popped up in my phone just as we arrived back. But I think there's, what, an hour, two hour difference between Israel and England? One to two. Okay. So, so, we, want, so we see this unfold, and now we learn that the, the mosque that this person attended that did this attack is funded by Saudi Arabia. Absolutely. And I'm very concerned. Look, Absolutely. I mean, I've always said I have fairly low expectations for, for President Trump. Uh, therefore, I'm not disappointed. And while I've liked some of the things that I've done, I see that a guy gets in office who has a certain agenda or belief system, a view of how things are operating. And he's, but they get in there, and it's like they get beat up by the State Department people. Absolutely. And a guy's like Rex Tillerson, who's now the Secretary of State, who's questioned about, well, is the Western Wall part of Israel? And he says, yes, I agree. It's the part of the, the Temple Mount. And he can't, they can't answer the question. It's like they go in there, and they get some kind of diplomatic geopolitical lobotomy yes. to say this. And then, so I'm concerned, and 
so I appreciate the symbolism of Trump going to the Western Wall. Some of what he said in Saudi Arabia was okay, but some of it was deeply troubling to me. Uh, and he, he did, it, it was a strange speech. It's hard to describe, but I'll try to unpack it a little bit tomorrow. He was tomorrow not as morning. bad as his predecessors. When Barack Obama made his trip to the Middle East, he didn't even come to Israel. Instead, he went to Arab capitals such as Cairo and essentially apologized for America and America's foreign policy. In front of the Muslim world. In front brother. of the Muslim world. The last act of, as president Barack Obama perpetrated was knifing Israel on the back, according to Alan Dershowitz, who supported Obama. Uh, and who's hardly a right wing. And he's hardly a right he's wing, a man liberal, man, a liberal Democrat. And he said he, he knifed Israel on the back, which is exactly what Obama did. Obama has always been an enemy of Israel, particularly in his releasing the $150 billion <coughs> in frozen assets to Iran, which they're basically spending to continue to finance global terror and even to kill Americans. This meant nothing to Barack Obama. Uh, there are people who would call this treason. There are people who would call this a treasonous act. Okay, well, Mr. Trump did his nothing nearly as nefarious as Barack Obama or as nefarious as George Bush. After September 11th, George Bush put a copy of the Koran received from the King of Saudi Arabia in the White House Library in order to honor Islam, he said. He made a speech at the CAIR, the Council of American Islamic Relations, Saudi-funded, three of its top officials, unindicted co-conspirators in raising money to fund Al-Qaeda. This was George Bush. And then begin selling, celebrating after September 11th, celebrating Ramadan in the White House. The House of Saud carried the Bush administration around in its back pocket. No, what Mr. Trump did is nothing nearly as, 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 as treacherous as what the Bush dynasty did or what Barack Obama did. Right. This is clear. However, he did not keep his promise to move the embassy. He, he certainly not did right. not do that. He certainly did not. Additionally, he's not threatened to stop American funding to the Palestinian Authority if they do not stop funding the financial reimbursement of the families of suicide bombers. He wouldn't do that. Right. When he went to Saudi Arabia, he talked about terror, but he didn't talk about Saudi Arabia funding the radicalism that breeds terror. It's business as usual. No, it's not as bad as his predecessors, but I'm grossly disappointed. Well, and then, um, and so he goes to the Western Wall when he's in Jerusalem. And that day, Pam and I, even though we were maybe half a mile away from the Western Wall where we were staying, they had, the city was locked down. I mean, there were, I think, 10,000 policemen brought in um, when we went over to the, what we call the promenade there to film a update a week ago last Sunday with Bill Koenig and um, Brian Schrager of JerusalemJournal.net. Um, and Bill and I, the night before, ev there were a lot of people in Jerusalem for Jerusalem Day, Yom Yerushalayim. Uh, we ran into Mike Huckabee while we were walking down the street and talked to him for a little bit. And a lot of Jew important Jewish people uh, from America and the Jewish community like Mark Levin uh, were, in there, were in Jerusalem for Yom Yerushalayim. And the people there that day in, uh, on Yom Yerushalayim Day, everybody that was local said they've never seen that many people in the city of Jerusalem. It was, it was yeah. packed. So... So Trump comes, and he goes to the Western Wall, he goes to the Israel Museum, he goes to Yad Vashem, and uh, he makes a speech. But the morning, so first he goes to the Western Wall, then he has some meetings. The next day, he goes down to Bethlehem and meets with Mahmoud Abbas, Abu Mazen, and I'm, I, he's already had Mahmoud Abbas to the White House for a meeting, he goes to meet with him in Bethlehem, and if you know anything about the history down there, is in Bethlehem, the Christian Palestinian population, Arab population, has declined yes. by, from, it, in the 1970s, 10%. it was 85% Christian, now it's about 15%. Right. The decline began when Yasser Arafat, the predecessor of Mr. Abbas, threatened to fill the mayor, Mayor Fridge, a Christian Arab, quote unquote, full of lead, if he talked about making peace with the Israelis. Well, what's, what was it, 10 years ago or so that people under the direction of, I think Arafat was still alive, 
uh, they, the PLO went in and occupied the Church of the Nativity, defecated in the pews. They were there. They, they refused to feed the priests, the nuns that were there. They defecated in the pews, and they occupied it for a month. And this is never discussed by anybody. I was there when that happened. I was, I was in the Ramat Rahel overlooking Bethlehem, speaking to the Israeli soldiers in Hebrew who were there when it was going on. The Church of the Nativity was invaded. The monks were hanging out signs in English, please rescue us. The Arab Muslims were pilfering religious artifacts. It was going on. The monks were saying, please rescue us. And CNN reported it as an Israeli siege, as an Israeli siege. It was an Israeli rescue, but they called it an Israeli siege. This is the corruption and lies and bias of the mainstream media. That's how far it goes. So I saw that with the description of what happened up near Nablus. And you do see that when you're in Jerusalem, you know, because we sort of stayed right on the border of an Orthodox neighborhood there near the, the new gate of the old city, which is the Muslim quarter, if I recall. Yeah, the Muslim quarter. And, and, there's, and East Jerusalem is just down the hill, essentially. Yes, that's right. Which is Arab. Uh, but I was struck. I essentially walked almost all the way around the city the last day we were there. And my cell phone would say, uh, you are entering another country. Even today, I mean, yes. Google Maps is telling me, you're entering another country. Are you sure you want to go there? And I'm, I'm in Jerusalem. And, and the, the evidence of the Herodian stones and the things they found on the Temple Mount, the city of David down below you at the south end of the Temple Mount, it's unmistakable. Unmistakable. Of, of Jewish and Christian presence there centuries centuries, half a millennia before Islam even came on the scene. Correct. You see, of the 57 Islamic states in the world, I repeatedly point out, not one of them will give Christians and Jews the rights that they get in America, in Britain, in Canada, in Australia, or in Israel. They have rights, the infidel doesn't, as they call non-Muslims. Yet, when someone is forced to stand up to them in self-defense, all of a sudden, they're the victim. And the BBC and CNN and MSNBC will be more than happy, more than happy to portray that misrepresentation as factual. This is what we're dealing with, fake news. Well, and you saw that. I mean, I saw a picture this week of the, a day or two after the bombing in Manchester, a local imam giving a copy of the Quran to the police chief in Manchester. You know, the city of Manchester arrests, arrests Christian evangelists preaching the gospel on the streets, but allows, allows radical Muslims to peddle their wares, pushing Wahhabism, uh, and threatening and bullying the Christian preachers. And this goes on with the political support and pressure on the police of the Manchester authorities. After that bombing, and I used to live in Manchester, England, my grandfather was born there. After that bombing, the next day, uh, the mayor of Manchester went on television, and his first reaction was, we must take caution to avoid Islamophobia. That was his reaction. That well, was his reaction. Theresa May came out. I, I, I don't know what it, you know, Jacob, we talk about this a lot when we're together. The, the collective delusion and madness that seems to be descending over Absolutely. people everywhere on the planet. The Washington Post asking, we're, we're trying to discover the motive of the bomber. <laughs> The motive of the bomber was obvious, but you can't say it. It's not politically correct. You can't say it on CNN. You can't say it on BBC. It, it's unbelievable. I'll tell you of one instance, not far from in the area you described. Well, let me ask you a question first. Yes. Didn't Jeremy Corbyn give a speech where he is, after the Manchester bombing where he essentially said that it was the people who opposed the Muslims who were responsible for that bombing? The provocation. That's how far it left. I mean, you gone. live in England. I mean... Corbyn yes. is nuts. Uh, the, the Labour Party has no credibility in England anymore. Not, well, that the, not, not that the Tory Party, the Conservative Party, does, but Labour is completely discredited. It's completely... Well, they've had a tremendous problem with anti-Semitism in the Labour course, Party absolutely. For, for decades. Absolutely. But also anti-Christian, particularly anti-evangelicism. This is absolutely true. Not far where you were describing from Nablus, 
the BBC, Bias, Blasphemy, and Cowardice. <laughs> um, they wouldn't put on a Jerry Springer opera of Mohammed being a little bit gay at Ramadan, but they did that of Jesus at Christmas time. And then they boasted about their courage standing up to the Christian fundamentalists and so forth. Let me see them do the same thing with Islam. BBC is Bias, Blasphemy, and Cowardice. The BBC reporter, Aura Gorling, she's Irish, married to a, to a Palestinian Arab Muslim. I believe he's a Muslim. Um, was reporting, and I was watching this in Hebrew, and I understand Arabic pretty well, reasonably well. They had a learning impaired, mentally retarded probably, a borderline retarded, young Palestinian Arab boy of about 14 as a suicide bomber who the Israelis intercepted. The Israeli ordnance disposal team was speaking in Arabic to him, translating from Hebrew to an interpreter, telling him in Arabic, don't move your left leg, now take these scissors and cut this one, but don't touch the other wire. They were trying to save the kid's life. Ora Gorling reported, the Israeli authorities would not allow us to interview the youth to get his side of the story. <laughs> he had a bomb on him. He had a bomb on him. They were trying to save his life. I watched it. I heard what they were saying. This is how sick and perverted the BBC is. Well, I've seen a video of a, a female at an Israeli checkpoint, and she, she has a bomb on, and I, I don't remember what happened. They were trying to tell her how to, and she blew herself up. Yeah, that's right. And this happens all the time. All and the I time. could tell the soldiers that I saw at these checkpoints, and we encountered them a number of times as we moved through those areas, they're kids. I mean, they're 19, 20, 21 years old, and they're put out there on the front lines. And I, I appreciate their bravery and their courage, but give me your thoughts on this, because my observation was that there's this push for a two-state solution. We know that it will fail, but the world keeps pushing in, pushing and pushing in. And I don't know if it's going to be forced on Israel, at some point, or if they'll just capitulate because they're tired of dealing with it. But my impression is that, one, it, if it does happen, it's not going to last very long. And two, it'll certainly lead to a, yet probably the third or whatever number, intifada. The Palestinians will, they'll be emboldened by it. But my impression is that with regard to what's going on in Syria and the Golan, and you can, you know, ISIS is like right across the border, and the Syrian army and the rebel, I mean, right there near Kenitra, that Israel's pretty much had it, and that the next time they have to do something, they're going to, they're just, yeah. they're just not going to hold back. Well, as we say in Hebrew, He who keeps Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps. The future of Israel is not in the hands of Israel. It's in the hands of the God of Israel. We know the Antichrist will bring a false peace to the Middle East, ultimately. That, of course, will be a false peace. Real and lasting peace will only come when Yeshua, Jesus, is on the throne of David. We know that from scriptural prophecy in both Testaments. However, let's talk about this two-state solution. In 1968, in 1968... King Hussein of Jordan, who I met in Virginia when I was 15, the father of King Abdullah, said that Jordan is Palestine. 70% of the population of Jordan are Palestinian Arabs. Approximately 30% are Hashemite Bedouin Arabs from Saudi Arabia. He said Jordan is Palestine. In 1970, Black September, Yasser Arafat said Jordan is Palestine. The British government with the partition said Jordan is Palestine. The United Nations and the League of Nations said Jordan is Palestine. There is and has always been a two-state solution. But as I said, these people in the West Bank went to bed one day in the early 1970s as Jordanians woke up and the tooth fairy came and waved the magic wand and told them now they were transformed into Palestinians. So there's already a two-state two -state, solution. But now they... They don't even want a three-state solution because Hamas controls Gaza and the Palestinian Authority controls the West Bank, Judea, and Samaria. So now you're up to a three-, four-state solution. But ultimately, they want a one-state solution. They want a right of return of the Arabs who, the descendants of Arabs who left Israel 
under the direction of the United Arab Command. When the 70 Israel years ago. 70 years ago, when the Israelis told them to stay, a right to come back, so they will simply demographically obliterate Israel's existence. They want a one-state solution. It is jihad. They are jihadists. They have the doctrine of tahweed. They use the word salim or salom, peace, when they speak to the West. But in Arabic, they use the word hudna, a temporary ceasefire until they can get the strategic advantage to continue the hudna. They already have a two-state solution. Then they're really talking of a four-state solution, but ultimately they want a one-state solution, and that state will not be Israel. That is their demand. God, however, has a different plan. It is all completely hypocritical, and it is coming to the text and the prophecies of Zechariah chapter 12, verses 1 through 10 particularly. That is what it is aiming for. And it's interesting, the symbolic, what, what they did archaeologically, there would be a holy site. Yes. And then a conquering army would come in, and they wouldn't obliterate the site, they would build something over it. Absolutely. They would desecrate it. Then they would get it back, and somebody else would build, and then you know, the, Crus the Byzantines came in, and the Crusaders came in. And they always, so it's easy to find these sites that have, easy. like Mamre and the Temple Mound and the Cave sure. of Machpelah, um, and even the Church of the Holy Sepulchre and other places in Jerusalem. But, um, but they always build symbolically there. I, I'd never seen this before. I'd been there twice before. As we were driving out, he pointed to uh, Gibeah. Yes. And on top of the hill or mountain there, is this large building that's unfinished. And I was told that that was where King Hussein was building his palace because that's where King Saul ruled yes, from. Yes, that's correct. You also see a contest between the construction of mosques and churches. Them wanting mosques next to churches and making claims on the land, that's even happening in Nazareth, in Israel proper. The point being, let's not forget something, another complete, misrepresentation of fact by the mainstream media is this. From the end of the British mandate and the UN partition, we're speaking of from May of 1948 through June of 1967, nearly 20 years, nearly 20 years, the Gaza Strip, the West Bank, East Jerusalem, the Golan Heights were all in the hands of Arab Muslims. If they wanted if they saw a need for a second Arab Muslim Palestinian state, in addition to the one that they said they already had in Jordan, why didn't they just make one when they had nearly 20 years to do it? Nobody would have stopped them. It is all ridiculous. It doesn't make any sense. So uh, on Yom Yerushalayim, Pam and I decided, we were going to go the day before, but because Trump was at the Yad Vashem Holocaust Museum uh, giving a speech, they just, you know, the Israeli government is interesting. They just, they'll just come in and shut down the whole place. I mean, they shut down the whole, essentially the whole old city the day Trump went to the Western Wall. Uh, when he went to Yad Vashem the next day, they shut that down. So we decided on Yom Yerushalayim, we took the light rail out. Uh, you know, down uh, Jaffa, Jaffa Street or Jaffa Street. Jaffa Road. And uh, went to the Holocaust Museum, which is just this oppression of evil. It's the most well-done museum I've ever been in in my life. The design of it, you kind of descend down into the depths of despair, and at the end you walk up this ramp and you get a view of part of Jerusalem. It's, yes. it's very inspiring. So we went from there back to... Jaffa Street, or Jaffa Road, where the light rail comes, and we, we got off, and then that was, there were these groups of young uh, Jewish men, kids, high school kids, uh, middle school kids, elementary school kids, dancing down the street, waving Jewish flags, and shouting, and screaming, and joy. It was such a contrast between the Ad Vashem and what was actually going on in Jerusalem yes. in that time. And, and it's the, predicted in Scripture. Right, and, and the one thing that you get is this uh, when you're in the Arab areas, it's death and despair. When you're in Jerusalem, even though it's tough, and Jerusalem's not an easy place to live, I don't think, uh, but there's life there. I mean, 
there's kids, there's children, there's activity. It's, and it's, it's both Jews and Arabs living there together. You Jews, know, Christians, and Arabs. When you cross the causeway from Singapore to Malaysia, you feel this demonic oppression in the very atmosphere itself. When you step from Eilat across the border into Egypt, in Sinai, you feel this demonic oppression. There's something demonic in the atmosphere, I'm convinced, where you have that spirit. I do not believe Allah is the God of Christians and Jews. It was the Nabataean moon god. It is not the name of a proper noun. It is the name of a word for God, but it's not the God of Christians and Jews. It's not the same God. It is the Nabataean moon god. Um, and he was worshipped as a pagan idol in pre- Islamic history. Uh, I don't believe they have the same same God. Uh, and certainly he doesn't have the same characteristics as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as revealed in the person of the Lord Jesus. Having said that, there is a move of God among Muslims in the Far East that I've seen in Indonesia and in Malaysia and other countries and in areas of Africa, and it's converging towards the Middle East. I am praying and believing God for a harvest of souls from the Islamic world among the Arabs before Jesus comes back. They, are, too, are the children of Abraham. God considers Jews and Arabs to be brothers. And I will admit freely, as somebody with a Jewish family, my children are born in Galilee, that the best believers I've met in my life, the most Christ-like Christians I've met in my life, have been people saved out of Islam. You will not find a better believer in your life than somebody truly saved out of Islam. I am believing God for a harvest of souls from the Arab world, much the same as we're seeing a harvest of souls now among the Jews. I praise God for the incredible increase in the number of Jewish believers in Israel. Going back to the 1970s, I remember when there were probably about 200 Jewish believers in Israel. Now there are Thousands. Actually, Thousands. We went to the Kasperi Center, which actually yes. I think did the definitive study in the late 90s. And we had a tour there by a, a wonderful friend, uh, the executive director there. And she said that you know, that's the definitive study, and they're updating it now. And I asked, her name is Jennifer, I asked Jennifer, what, what do you think the number is now? Yes. Because I, I know you've said that it used to be two, 300. That's all. And now you're talking about thousands. And she said, well, I've seen numbers of ten to 15,000, but she thought it was much higher. That there is a very... Nobody big, knows. There's a big move of God. They're, they're working on hopefully publishing something very soon that will have better numbers. Yeah. Nobody knows. Now remember, this is not just in Israel. This is in Russia. It's in the United States. It's in many countries. France. It's in Argentina. There is an explosion in the number of Jews coming to faith as Romans 11 predicted would happen in the last days. If there's any sign of the return of Jesus more conspicuous than the rebirth of Israel, it is the increase in numbers of the natural branches being grafted in again of Jews coming to faith in Jesus. The cry of my heart is that that will increase and multiply exponentially, but also that we will see a move of God among the Arab Muslims, as we're already seeing a move of God among the Asian and certain quarters African Muslims. Well, even some of the prophets, and that's, the whole teaching can be done on that. And I think Dr. Fruchtenbaum, who actually was on his, I, from what I heard, his Arnold. last tour, Arnold, Arnold. Fruchtenbaum, who is a friend of yours, and you know he has a great study. At least that's where I first read it about the Arab states and prophecy. And there's great promises, Absolutely. even to Persia. Absolutely. And, uh, to these Muslim countries about how they'll come to worship. But um, right now, I, you know, personally, I just see this final conflict. There's, there's good news there. There's bad news. And I always have this mixed feeling about Bible prophecy because I know what the great hope is, is Jesus returns at the end of the 70th week and he cleans up the mess and sets up his kingdom. And then it'll be great. But there's, there's trouble in between here. So while I'm excited when I see bad things happening, I'm also troubled because I know that there's a lot of people that I know that may not 
have a chance yes. uh, to accept the Lord before the end comes. Yeah, you know, I thank God for Christians who support Israel and who recognize the prophetic significance of the rebirth of Israel. I really do. But the best way you can bless Israel, the best way you can bless Israel is to pray for and work for their salvation. Uh, evangelism of Jews and Arabs is the biggest spiritual need in Israel. That's not to discourage support for Israel in the practical realm of petitions mm -hmm. and things of this nature. I do all that and I advocate it. But the most important need in Israel is undoubtedly the gospel of Yeshua HaMashiach. And for my Arab friends, Rai Isu Salam Majdan Hallelujah, Yeshua HaMashiach, Yeshua Akbar, Muhammad La Akbar, El Kitab, El Kitab, Quran La Akbar, Kitab Akbar, Yeshua HaMashiach, Yeshua Umabarak. And we know that eventually at the end of this period of time, you know, we have this promise from Romans 11 that all Israel will Amen. be saved. And we know the promises of Zechariah. Then they shall yes. look at them on him whom they pierced and shall yes. mourn. Absolutely. The tragedy being two-thirds of the people are going to be killed. Something horrible is going to happen in the Middle East among both the Jews and the Arabs, hence the desperation for the gospel. I would say to my Jewish friends listening, there's only one question. It's not the history of anti-Semitism perpetrated in the name of Christ. An Orthodox Jew with a yarmulke assassinated Itzhak Rabin in the name of Moses, Moshe Rabbeinu, and the Torah. I can't blame Moses and the Torah for what was done in his name, and I cannot blame Jesus, Rabbi Yeshua Bar Yosef, me that said it, for what was done in his name. I can't do that. There's only one question. Is he the Messiah? Yeshe'el ha'ad, lefih ha'nevo'ot, betanach, betoratecha, im huken u hulo meshecheno. Ani betoach, she huken meshecheno. Dugma, v'daniel ha'navi parakesha, meshecheno hitzterek lavo v'lamut, lihnei ha'horban sh'rabet megdash ha'shenit. The Messiah had to come and die before the second temple would be destroyed. Daniel chapter 9. He had to make the Gentiles believe in the Jewish God. Who caused the Gentiles to worship the God of Israel? Even Rambam admitted it was Jesus. He is the Messiah. He is coming again. The Jews are back in Israel for one reason. To receive him as Mashiach when he comes. But it's not going to be an easy time period between now and then. The best thing any Jew can do is ask the God of their fathers, is he the Messiah, based on the Hebrew Scriptures. Read your own Scriptures. Rabbi Yeshua Bar Yosef said something interesting. If you believed Moshe Rabbeinu, you'd believe me also. If you really believe Moses and the Torah, not rabbinic tradition, just the Hebrew Scriptures, you'll know if or not he's the Messiah. He is the Messiah. I don't think I can add anything more to that. It's, look, it's a, it's a fantastic place to visit. I always come away thinking that my time there has been both too short and too long. And I want to go back uh, because I know that this is where this final battle, this fine, the narrative of human history converges and comes to a close and Jesus returns and sets up his kingdom. Absolutely. Um, John, you're absolutely right. Jerusalem is where Satan got his biggest defeat. And the scriptures tell us it is Jerusalem where he will get his final defeat. It's interesting, when you go to Samaria, that was the, the, the city that Sennacherib had the most trouble conquering. It took him three years. But his goal wasn't Samaria, or the nope. at least in his own archives, I think it's 46 other cities that he destroyed, or 46 that he destroyed in Israel as he was conquering. His goal was Jerusalem. That's right. And to wipe out the Jewish people. Correct. And in Samaria, you see one of the three Augustus temples erected yes. by Herod. Yes. There, Caesarea Maritime, Caesarea Philippi. Yeah. But 
the probably the best preserved one of them is there at Samaria. Yes. Where eventually under Diocletian, and then from Diocletian up to the time of of uh, Constantine, you didn't worship the emperor. You were you Correct. were killed, and that was Jew and Christian. Correct. Um, but Sennacherib, when he came in, and I'm working up a teaching on this. His goal wasn't Samaria or the other 45 cities. Yes. His goal was to destroy Jerusalem and the Jews. Yes. And wipe them out. Correct. And what we're seeing unfolding in the Middle East right now is the exact same thing. Yes. What you say is right. We read this when he sent this messenger. Uh, via the, when they, they reached as far as Lachish, not far from Jerusalem, but he sent Rabshakeh to try to persuade Hezekiah to surrender. He wanted to wipe out the Jews. Why? Same reason Haman did. Same reason Amalek did. Same reason Pharaoh did. To prevent the coming of the Messiah. Well, it didn't work then, and it's not going to work now. And the Jews fled in great numbers, and Jerusalem expanded in in size greatly at that time. Look, I'm sure we've covered the 30 minutes that we talked about when we first started. John, I just want to tell you how much I appreciate your ministry and your support for Israel, and your upholding biblical truth and prophecy in these times. Your ministry on YouTube has been a tremendous blessing to many people, including to us at Moriel. May the Lord continue to bless you in it. And likewise, I appreciate the things you do, too, that you travel to these hard areas, China, Vietnam, Indonesia, and really have a good ministry among those, and I I greatly respect you for that. And a lot of people just don't know that. So I think we're going to wrap this up. We know that Jesus is returning soon and all the signs in the world seem to be unmistakable. Uh, and what's the line I've heard you say? The first Christians were Jews. And the last Christians will be Jews. Romans 11, Revelation chapter 7. The natural branches are grafted in again. The first Christians were Jews and the last Christians will be Jews. And let's pray and hope that that day comes soon. Amen. And God is glorified by everything that Amen. happens. Well, that's it. This is Jake, John Haller and Jacob Prash, and thanks for watching. Thank you for joining us. God bless.